My name is Reverend Irene willis Hassan, and I'm the Minister for Refugee and Migration Services with United Church of Christ National Ministries. Over the last year or so, we've seen a number of large changes happening in the refugee resettlement system and the immigration system in general for the United States. And much of this has to do with the evolution of private sponsorship as one of the primary modes of the ability for folks to resettle in the United States. Um, now, there are a number of concerns that we've highlighted in past webinars about this evolution, and um, the most current model that we're looking at is called Welcome Core. However, Welcome Core is not fully designed and running uh, yet in, in a fully fledged way. So we're not going to just be talking about Welcome Core today. We're going to be talking about, um, well, its evolution and its different uh, ways that you could plug into private sponsorship how that engages with the formal refugee resettlement system, concerns about what it means for the refugee resettlement system, and celebrations that it could that it could potentially provide for us and for our new refugee neighbors. With me, I have uh, from Church World Service um, the private sponsorship coordinator, uh, whose name is Katie Randall, and the director of private sponsorship, whose name is Stacy Clack. And in just a moment, I'm going to welcome them to speak more with you. But first of all, I want to tell you what Church World Service is. So for those of you who don't know, the United Church of Christ is a member of Church World Service. And Church World Service acts as a sort of um, umbrella organization for all of the, or for many denominations to be able to plug into resources and national networking. And so they do a great job of providing those things to engage um, a wider audience than just what the UCC has. Another reason why I invited Church World Service onto this call um, to help us understand these tiers of Welcome Corps that we are seeing is because they are, um, and you can correct me about what the correct MOU language is, but um, they are a partner of the US government in trying to roll out these sponsorship programs. So they are a good intermediary for understanding how the private model is going to connect to the federal model and what that means for us as a, as a denomination. Um, and because we're members of Church World Service, this will matter, matter a lot to us as we um, learn how to engage in advocacy around making sure this program is responsible and um, rolled out well, and also how to actually sponsor folks coming through the program. For example, what sort of nationality do they need? What sort of visa to, do they need? Do these emails coming to my inbox do any of those folks qualify? We covered some of this in an earlier webinar called Migrant Sponsorship. Oh, there's my son. It's spring break. I apologize. I apologize. There will probably be some interruptions with children. Um, I understand spring break for many of us. So um, children always welcome in church, right? Um, anyway, so uh, I interrupted my son. Uh, we're going to be learning about how these private sponsorship models um, are applicable and, or not applicable. Um, and we've already done one webinar on this. It was called Migrant Sponsorships, How to Respond to the Heartbreaking Email. And in that, I did not recommend using Welcome Corps because of its um, because it doesn't have the qualifications that are ready to produce something that's useful yet, in my opinion. However, uh, as the situation evolves, we're going to get better information from, again, these umbrella partners at Church World Service. Um, if you have any questions, please drop them in Q&A, and I will either be answering them in Q&A, or uh, we're going to have a chance to have discussion afterwards in which I can speak your questions out loud to either myself or the panelists. So at this point, I would like to welcome Katie Randall, who is the uh, Private Sponsorship Coordinator for Church World Service. Thank you for being with us, Katie. Thanks so much, Irene. I really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, we know there have been a lot of questions. Um, uh, so many private sponsorship initiatives have been stood up so quickly in the last year. And suddenly, there, there feel like there are so many pathways uh, that people can take in that attempt to, to welcome the stranger and to provide that humanitarian support. So I'm happy to talk with you guys today. Um, I've also invited, you'll see her name here, I've also invited Lucretia Keenan from Community Sponsorship Hub. We will talk a little bit more about that when we get to the, the Welcome Core portion. Um, and she is here to uh, help uh, myself and Stacy answer questions about what Welcome Core will look like. 
Uh, but first, uh, we'll talk a little bit about CWS's overall private sponsorship programming and different opportunities for sponsorship. So I will go ahead and share my screen. And I'll ask everyone the question about if they can see my screen. Everybody good? Okay. I mean, I, I really only can see Stacy's face. So Stacy nodded. So I think we're good. All right. So uh, we have uh, our, our brand new title for our private sponsorship uh, programming, which is the CWS Neighbor Network. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the Neighbor Network, what it is, how you can be involved in it. Uh, first, we'll talk a little bit about uh, church world service. We are a faith-based organization transforming communities around the globe through just and sustainable responses to hunger, poverty, displacement, and disaster. Uh, like Irene mentioned, we are uh, one of the uh, members of, of the consortium for Welcome Corps. We're involved in private sponsorship. We're also one of the nine, soon to be 10, uh, refugee resettlement agencies in the United States. We have a long history of refugee in the refugee resettlement space here, and uh, we hope to continue to have that. All right, so private sponsorship. Uh, I've said it a lot. Irene said it. Let's talk a little bit about what it is, what it involves. Uh, so private sponsorship um, is an alternate pathway for certain non-refugee, and now with the launch of Welcome Corps, refugee populations. So traditionally, the traditional refugee resettlement model, uh, someone comes to the United States and they're supported by a local resettlement agency office. They have a caseworker, they receive reception and placement services, that's the, the name for that initial 90-day program uh, of services that they receive. Uh, so private sponsorship pathways uh, allow private groups and organizations and citizens to, to sponsor folks outside of that traditional model. For CWS programming, uh, and, and for most kind of formalized uh, private sponsorship form, uh, programming, uh, sponsors sponsor in groups of at least five. Uh, we know that sponsorship happens best in groups. Uh, so any group working with CWS, we make sure that it's a group and not just an individual so that they can divide up service delivery and, and kind of share that burden. Private sponsors agree to provide all what we call core services. So anything you might imagine someone would need and to get established in the United States, like housing, employment, uh, benefits applications, school enrollment, English language classes, private sponsors are responsible for making sure all of those things happen. They basically act in the capacity that a caseworker would if this were if, if someone were being sponsored uh, or going to be resettled by resettlement agency staff. Uh, groups uh, have make at least a 90 day commitment to support sponsors or to support beneficiaries of sponsorship. Um, and local agent local resettlement agency support is often limited for those welcome through private sponsorship. And that's just because offices, you know, because it's a private program, because offices don't receive federal funding for these kinds of programs, staff support uh, is often limited because offices are uh, don't have capacity to to add to the uh, to the the arrivals they're seeing through the traditional refugee resettlement programs. So we really expect private sponsors to take on uh, the bulk of that service delivery and understanding that local offices may not be able to provide a lot of a lot of support. Um, so instead, groups receive remote support. Uh, and this is this is offered by CWS headquarters for all of our private sponsorship groups. Um, additionally, groups are responsible for raising all funds for sponsorship. Uh, those of you who welcomed through the Afghan Placement Assistance Program uh, may be familiar with the term per capita. That's essentially uh, a, an amount of money uh, that comes to agency offices to help pay for things like rent, uh, utilities, uh, food for refugees in their first 90 days. Um, sponsor groups during APA, um, many of them also received some of that per capita funding to use with groups. Uh, with private sponsorship, we don't see any per capita funding. Groups are responsible for fundraising uh, an amount that would be equivalent or exceed what we would have seen with the, with the per capita. And I should say also that I know I know we'll have questions at the end, but you know we're going to be going through a lot of information. If there's something that I'm not explaining well or that you're not understanding, please feel free to drop a question in the chat so that we can address it in real time. Um, I want to make sure that I'm being very clear about all these different acronyms and programs and pathways uh, so that everybody's clear on, on where we are. 
All right, so the CWS Neighbor Network, this is our brand new shiny thing. We've been working in private sponsorships since Uniting for Ukraine started last year, and groups were able to sponsor Ukrainians into the United States. But we have now made our kind of umbrella program that encompasses all of our private sponsorship programming. And the goal of this is really to, as the name implies, uh, set up uh, a really sustainable private sponsorship infrastructure that really leans into uh, the idea of new neighbors, the idea of having a network of people in a community that can leverage their own resources, their own community networks, their own relationships to really improve integration outcomes for newcomers and make sure they feel very supported in their new communities. So we have our existing programming uh, includes humanitarian parole sponsorship, and we'll talk a little bit more in, in depth about that in a second. So that includes the Uniting for Ukraine pathway and also the processes for Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans, which was process for Venezuelans in December and then was then expanded to include Cubans, Haitians, and Nicaraguans in January. Um, we have a pending application for Welcome Corps. You'll see that PSO acronym. I'll talk a little bit about that more later. And then we also anticipate under this program that we will have asylum seeker support that is forthcoming that will be as we establish our neighbor network and build out our programming a little more uh, that will be kind of the next phase of where this goes. There are a lot of questions about humanitarian parole and what that means. Uh, parole, we think of parole in the United States as, you know, associated with like the criminal legal system, right? Uh, in immigration, humanitarian parole is a legal but temporary uh, status that expires after two years in the United States. Uh, so that's that's the status that uh, folks from Ukraine, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, and Haiti are coming in under through these sponsorship programs. Uh, there is little government oversight of these programs. Um, really, uh, anyone who can show that they have the financial means to sponsor can submit an application. Um, and then if that's approved, a travel visa is issued, someone can come and there's not much follow up on if the sponsor did what they said they were going to do, um, if all services were provided. Uh, so we're seeing we're seeing quite a big gap there. And so our CWS programs, our neighbor network is intended to help fill some of those support gaps uh, so that we can be kind of as as Irene alluded to, right, there are, there are problems with um, making sure beneficiaries have the things that they need and our goal is to make sure that that happens by providing support to the sponsors themselves. Um, so private sponsor groups, like I mentioned, uh, in, this, in these humanitarian parole pathways, they apply with uh, USCIS to sponsor certain populations who are eligible for parole. Right now, that's Ukrainians, Cubans, Haitians, Venezuelans, and Nicaraguans. Uh, you'll see our graphic here says Ukrainian PSGs, that is being updated to include all of the other parole populations as well, but this gives you an idea of the, the steps that private sponsor groups working with CWS through this program uh, would move through. So initially, like I said, they gather a group of five community members who are interested in sponsoring one of the parole populations. We have a private sponsorship interest form that they fill out. After they receive an onboarding invitation from CWS headquarters staff, they complete a basic service plan. That's going to make sure that any group sponsoring uh, has checked in with their community to make sure they have all the necessary infrastructure. They uh, know what public transportation looks like in their community. They know if their schools have ELL programming. They know if there are employment opportunities there. So those are the things we look for at CWS before we agree to, uh, to partner with the group in this effort. We want to make sure that beneficiaries are going to places that where they can be supported. Um, groups sign an MOA, a Memorandum of Agreement with CWS agreeing to our policies, which include things like um, you know, anti-human trafficking, um, making sure everyone's background check, things like that. Um, after groups are approved by us, uh, then we help we have a fundraising toolkit that we send them so they can begin fundraising. We have them complete background checks and training. Um, and then they create a sponsor profile. With uh, We partner with welcome.us. You all may have heard of their Welcome Connect portal. It's almost like a, you know, we've, we've jokingly referred to it kind of as like a dating site, right? Because a sponsor creates a profile. Beneficiaries can look at that profile and see if they want to start a conversation with the group about uh, their town and the support they can offer. Um, and then, so CWS is actually not involved in those matchings. It gives beneficiaries a lot more agency in determining 
who they want to be their sponsor. So those conversations happen. They just they make that match. Um, and then groups, CWS helps groups fill out an I-134A sponsorship form with USCIS. They wait for approval, and then we help groups prepare for that arrival process. Um, and just some notes on the I-134A, it says in our graphic that it's approximately one to two weeks for approval. We're seeing a longer approval timeline now that the parole populations also include uh, Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans. We're seeing it be closer to about four weeks. Um, but the government is looking for a group's proof of financial capability to sponsor. And then they require a primary applicant, but uh, those applications can include supplemental evidence uh, from groups like money that you fundraise, bank accounts, pay stubs. They're essentially just looking for evidence that as a group, you can financially support the beneficiaries you're applying to sponsor. This is, speaking of money, this is always a question we get about our humanitarian parole sponsorship programs, is how much money should we raise? And the answer, like many things in refugee resettlement, is so nuanced. It really depends on the situation and what's going on. Um, for instance, each of the humanitarian parole populations are eligible for different things after they arrive in the United States. Uh, Ukrainians are eligible to work right away using their parole documentation. They are eligible for benefits in the United States, including food stamps, cash assistance, and Medicaid if they're otherwise income eligible. Uh, so we recommend fundraising at least about three months of cost of living support, rent, utilities, food, things like that, until those benefits uh, are and work and jobs are established. For Cubans and Haitians, they're not eligible to work right away. They have to wait for their employment authorization document, uh, which can even expedite it, takes about three to four months, but they are eligible for benefits in the United States. So we recommend about three to four months of cost of living support. Same thing, rent, utilities, food. Uh, Nicaraguans and Venezuelans, this is our highest sponsorship lift, and this is a population really in need of sponsors because it's a higher lift. Uh, these populations, unfortunately, are not eligible to work right away. They must wait for their EADs, and they're also not eligible for any benefits in the United States. Um, in most in most states, some states have um, support offered, but most most states don't. They're not eligible for those kinds of benefits. And so we ask groups to fundraise, you know, at least five to six months of cost of living support because these populations really will not have any access to income until they are able to start working, which could take a matter of months. So it's going to depend, even though these are all under the same parole status, they're eligible for different things, and we ask groups to prepare for different situations. The, CW, the support that CWS provides through all this, um, so like I mentioned, this is all coming from CWS headquarters. This is remote support. Um, after groups are approved to be a PSG with CWS, a private sponsor group, they receive three to six months of remote support from us. And that just depends on the comfort level of the group and where they feel the beneficiaries are in the resettlement process. If after three months, everybody has jobs, everybody is in an apartment, it's all situated and going great, Maybe we can scale back on CWS support. If you're sponsoring a Nicaraguan family and they haven't received their EAD yet and they're still uh, not closer to financial self-sufficiency, maybe you want to keep meeting with CWS to keep having that support. Uh, we provide weekly and on-demand technical assistance uh, via Zoom. Um, we have a private sponsorship manual that's currently for Uniting for Ukraine and is being updated to include other parole populations as well, uh, and, and that including and some other core service delivery guides. Um, CWS staff are available to help groups navigate internal conflict within their group, which we, you know, that that is a very common thing that happens within sponsor groups, and how to approach conflicts with beneficiaries so that we can avoid what we call sponsor breakdown, where the people who agreed to sponsor are no longer willing or able to sponsor that beneficiary. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, the, really the benefit here is that groups can leverage their own community knowledge and resources, and we like to think that we help groups tap into that and figure out the questions to ask and figure out how to, to network in their communities. Um, we also have access to a CWS Airbnb grant for all these populations through June 30th. And Irene, I hope it's okay that I put this in here, but UCC offers $2,000 per individual for groups sponsoring Ukrainians or Haitians. So that's an additional layer, layer of support, especially for churches that feel like they're not able to fundraise quite as much. 
And so that's our humanitarian parole programming that is active. That's any group can sign up and sponsor and do that today if they want it. Uh, Welcome Corps is our the new initiative uh, that allows private sponsor groups or PSGs to welcome those with refugee status. So all of the programs that I've mentioned up until this point have been for those with humanitarian parole status, which is that legal but temporary pathway. Uh, Welcome Corps is for groups that have already been uh, given refugee status and would be eligible for anything that other refugees are eligible for here in the United States, including a path to long-term residency and citizenship. This is much more centralized than uniting for Ukraine and processes for Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans, uh, where with that program, any individual who wanted to sponsor could fill out a sponsorship application with USCIS. There's very little oversight. We don't really know where beneficiaries go or what happens after they arrive. Welcome Corps is much more centralized. Groups can only sponsor through the Welcome Corps portal. Uh, they uh, are linked. They, they're kind of managed through that, that consortium. The applications are approved through um, Community Sponsorship Hub and uh, other consortium members. Um, so we know where beneficiaries go. We know where the groups are. And we, we make sure that services are being provided. Church World Service is both a consortium member, uh, so we're one of, uh, I believe it's six, six organizations in the consortium that are uh, shaping the Welcome Corps initiative, uh, and then we are also applying to be a private sponsor organization, or a PSO, and I will, I believe it's the next slide, I'll talk a little bit, yes, about what a PSO is. So there, are the kind of the general structure of Welcome Corps will be that there are private sponsor organizations, and these are organizations that commit to supporting private sponsor groups through their service delivery period. And these organizations commit to overseeing client safety, uh, concerns at the PSG level are escalated to those PSOs. They're expected to provide that support to groups so that community groups and churches know how to welcome and know how to provide resettlement support. Uh, so this, um, the private sponsor organizations can work on a national level or a local level. They just have to commit to supporting a certain number of PSGs. Um, so CWS is in the process of applying, uh, putting in a PSO application. Uh, and then you have private sponsor groups who commit to providing all the core services. With Welcome Corps, they commit to raising $2,275 per individual that they'd like to sponsor. And there are no geographic restrictions on placement. So uh, just like with humanitarian parole sponsorship, uh, a Welcome Corps sponsor could be located anywhere in the United States. It doesn't matter how close or far they are from a local resettlement agency office. And Welcome Corps is rolling out in two phases. So we have, well, I know we've gotten a ton of questions about this, and I'm sure you all have as well, about when people can sponsor their family members. That's a big, big question about Welcome Corps. So Welcome Corps is rolling out in two phases. The first phase, phase one, is what's been referred to as stranger to stranger matching, where private sponsor groups will be matched with refugees who are already in the pipeline for admission to the United States. So these are our folks who um, will be matched with groups based on uh, you know, location and based on support that groups can offer. Uh, there's there's different uh, things that go into that matching, uh, kind of that hand matching process, uh, but it will be folks who are already in the pipeline. So groups won't be able to refer anyone or kind of choose who they're sponsoring. Um, and that will begin spring. It, it will, it was starting very soon. Um, and then with phase two, this will be the referral matching process that I know a lot of folks are, are really looking forward to or are wondering about where private sponsor groups can refer people who already have refugee status uh, for resettlement in the United States. And they'll, they'll be able to refer people uh, by name and say, we want to sponsor this person. Um, we're still waiting on more details about phase two. Um, that will begin later this year after phase one uh, is established. And we, we anticipate that we'll have more information about phase two, you know, closer, closer to that um, in the coming months. And this is, this is the anticipated, you'll notice, support from CWS. Um, like I mentioned, we are in the application process to be a PSO. Uh, so this is all, this is all tentative. Um, but if approved, we anticipate that our support for CWS partnered private sponsor groups will look a lot like our humanitarian parole support uh, under our other neighbor network programs with weekly and on-demand TA calls, staff expertise to navigate conflict and problems. Um, and right now, churches can begin the Welcome Corps private sponsor group application process and then link up with CWS as a PSO um, if CWS's PSO application is approved and if they, of course, are approved as a private sponsor group. 
So uh, I know that we, we need some action items, right? What can we do right now? So for churches, I know that there have been questions about what to do with the, and I think Irene mentioned this at, at the beginning too, what do you do when you get uh, so many emails that are just absolutely heartbreaking? Um, what we've been doing at CWS and what we'd recommend you to do as well is refer those kind of cold call requests for sponsorship to the Welcome Connect portal. That portal I mentioned where people can connect with sponsors if they don't already have someone in the U.S. that they know to sponsor them. Uh, this opens on the 18th of each, each month. Um, it's only open uh, until a certain quota for the month is met. There are a certain number of, of spots available. Um, it's recommended that churches go through this portal for stranger matches. Um, and CWS, we have sample text that we can send out um, to you all as needed about like how to respond to these in an empathetic way. Um, Stacy, were you? Did yeah, you those are just for the humanitarian parole populations. I just want to clarify to say oh, yes. yes. <laughs> Go ahead. These are just these are just for humanitarian parole populations: Ukrainians, Nicaraguans, Venezuelans, Haitians, Cubans. That's a great point that I should have put on here because we are getting a lot of emails from people who are really looking forward to that phase two of Welcome Corps, uh, where they are not a humanitarian parole population; they are someone with refugee status that is looking for a sponsor in the United States. We have text for that as well that talks about phase two of Welcome Corps and how we're not. We're not ready to do any of that yet, but presumably in the future we will, we will be able to do that. Um, but for humanitarian parole, they can go through the Welcome Connect portal. Um, interested churches uh, for humanitarian parole sponsorship can fill out a CWS interest form, which is linked here. I can send out these slides and also I can put links in the chat once we move to the Q&A. And then they can also begin the Welcome Corps application process. And like I mentioned, um, uh, hopefully link up with CWS or another PSO uh, for uh, support um, at, at a later time. And I believe that is the it. So I am happy to take questions about CWS. Stacy is here to help field CWS questions as well. Um, and then of course we have Lucretia who can help field any um, community sponsorship hub or welcome core specific questions uh, that, that you all may have. So if anyone has any questions from the Q&A that you would like to be answered live uh, or expanded on from the answers that Stacy and I provided in writing, please resend it through the Q&A and we will answer it live at this point. This is now question and answer period um, in which you are able to answer ask these questions from a live participant instead of just the chat. Um, so while we wait on those Q&As, I do have some Q&As for you, Katie, that actually come from um, the UCC's engagement with CWS in trying to understand the legislative path of uh, well, well, Welcome Corps is going. And these um, questions could also be for Lucretia. Uh, welcome, Lucretia. Thank you for coming to uh, this UCC national webinar. Um, so the first question I have is that the administration has indicated that the private sponsorship program should be complementary to the US refugee admissions program, meaning that it doesn't replicate, it doesn't do the exact same thing. Uh, however, it looks like phases one of one and two, we're in phase one right now, of Welcome Corps are not in addition to the fiscal year 23-24 refugee, refugee admissions goal. So the question is, to what extent does the administration plan to ensure that private sponsorship is an additional and supplementary to U.S. rep. Okay, I will, I'll, I'll provide some of my own thoughts on it. And then Lucretia, you may have additional thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I would, I, I very much hope that in the next fiscal year that we'll see this be uh, an additional, in, in addition to the presidential determination. Uh, so I think right now, uh, you know, we we saw during the APA program that although offices did an incredible job suddenly welcoming, you know, 70 plus thousand Afghans, we really saw the effects of refugee resettlement infrastructure being gutted under the Trump administration, right? I think something like a third of offices had, offices had closed. And we're still working on building back up that infrastructure, still focusing on recovering. Uh, for this fiscal year, uh, for, for this year, as we 
go to meet that that quota, that goal for refugees, I think that expanding into more community sponsorship uh, so that people can can get here and we make sure to meet those target numbers without further overburdening staff uh, can be a way to do it. But I, I hope that the, we will continue to see uh, an effort to shore up and build out our traditional refugee infrastructure so that we really can have these uh, two pathways that complement each other. And before adding on to uh, Katie's remarks, just want to say hi again. My name is Lucretia Keenan, and I'm a strategist for the Community Sponsorship Hub. My focus um, with the organization is helping to support things, support all things around uh, the launch and implementation of private sponsorship, particularly through um, the recent launch of Welcome Corps. And then more broadly, my role on the team is really uh, thinking deeply about how we can collectively broaden um, community sponsorship opportunities to the American public and make it easier um, for Americans who have or have not yet engaged or supported refugee resettlement to do so. Um, so just wanted to give you a little bit of background on myself before jumping in. So, um, and just to say, um, as was alluded to by Katie and others, um, I'm here not only representing CSH, but also a consortium of partner organizations that have deep expertise in refugee resettlement um, that are collectively supporting this. So really bringing um, a diverse array of expertise um, and on the ground and uh, remote and virtual support um, around the launch of the program, working in partnership with the State Department. And um, I'll drop in some links as we go um, that can help people and just referring to like general FAQ or other information like fact sheets that have been put out by the State Department just to make sure people have seen those as well. On this question, um, so what has been um, formally um, uplifted by the State Department and others is that this program is intended to expand the capacity of U.S. refugee resettlement. Um, I think with um, all the, the consciousness towards like the recent um, just a uh, number of initiatives that have launched that I mean, I'm not a, a government representative, um, but um, it can be understandable that they may be considering just like what is the precise way that this program will expand the capacity of U.S. refugee resettlement, not only for the near term within this year, but in looking towards years ahead. And so um, right now, the program is starting just like any program in a way that allows for all the operational aspects of it to be um, implemented in a conscious, careful way that is um, operating in the same um, at the same time as a number of other programs. So it's wanting to make sure that the program is off to a good start, recognizing all the work that is simultaneously occurring across the US, um, noting like how um, the number of offices that closed in the Trump administration. I was buoyed by the fact that I recently went on to rapsnet.org. Um, that's one of the government sites that notes um, how many offices across the United States are engaged in refugee resettlement. And it was, Really heartening to see that um, from the recent map, there are almost 320 local um, sites, which um, is a boost of over 100 um, within the current administration. So that was incredible to see. And that just you know speaks to the resiliency of um, this network and other resettlement networks across the country. But I just want to emphasize, I think the intention and everything that's been conveyed to us by the State Department is there is a real want to make sure this expands the capacity of refugee resettlement. And I think even though there hasn't been a, a formal announcement beyond that about what exactly does that mean? And it, you know, is that in addition to the overall missions number um, is that at the core, the model of this program is that um, just naturally it already is expanding US refugee resettlement. The core of this program is focused on harnessing the great um, want and passion and resourcefulness of the American public to engage directly in refugee resettlement in a way that hasn't been possible to the same extent since the 1980s when there was another private sponsorship program that inherently is expanding the capacity um, of resettlement. And um, the fact that this can happen in any location across the US um, is also a, you know, a huge innovation um, in this work, um, conscious again towards resettlement efforts that are happening in other other areas around the country. So I'd say um, stay tuned because I fully expect that there will be more information shared 
and just um, a consciousness that like at, at any new program launch that it's done so in a way that's like careful to recognize there's already many things in the works and so wants to be um, respectful of that um, while also making sure that things are done very thoughtfully as they're unveiled and rolled out so that um, you know there's um, just every care around making sure that the private sponsor groups themselves, as well as the beneficiaries from the start, um, are set up for success um, through the launch of the program. Thank you so much, Lucretia. Uh, so we have a few more questions in Q&A. The next one, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer about why the UCC is recommending against Welcome Corps. And so Welcome Corps is evolving, as we've been discussing. And we have uh, these excellent resources at um, Community Sponsorship Hub and Church World Service that are helping to make it uh, as um, they've been talking about a more efficient program that will broaden the scope. However, uh, again, the recommendation in March 2023 from UCC national offices um, is that it does not currently expand and there's many concerns about it. May the main one being that um, private sponsors are paying for it instead of refuge offices getting paid for it. Um, and also the fact that it's cre it, at first it was creating a lot of false hope for migrants all over the world who are hoping that it was more like the Canadian system in which a community spo a sponsor can handpick someone to come be sponsored in Canada, and that is not the case with the U.S. system, nor is there um, intended at this point to be the case. So our concern at UCC National was that this was simply replicating and taking away resources from federal refugee resettlement offices instead of creating a supplementation of or expanding the ability to welcome. However, that recommendation stays in March of 2023, and we are on this call right now with Church World Service and community sponsorship hubs because they're doing an excellent job to make sure it does supplement, it does add to the value of being able to welcome. Um, also, another concern would be uh, potential scams and risks for both migrants who are vulnerable to human trafficking and churches that are similarly vulnerable by creating a sponsorship in a way that doesn't have to be federally um, or federally monitored. Uh, so that was the concerns in March of 2023, which are evolving and we do have um, lots of trust in Church World Service and community sponsorship hubs to be able to do this in a responsible way that does welcome more. Um, so I'm going to hand the next question in Q&A um, to either Katie or Lucretia about how much sheltered time would be available to the indi individual or family. I might, I might need a clarification on that next question in terms of that, but just to add that phase two of the program, so currently phase one is open, um, and that is in support of people that are already in the refugee resettlement pipeline, but phase two, which will be launched later this year, is geared um, in a way that's very similar to the Canadian private sponsorship programs. Just want to make sure that's clear, that the intention is there, that you would be able to identify in other countries some kind of called naming. And so just want to make sure that that is clear, that phase two is focused on exactly what you um, noted there, Irene. And in terms of the amount of um, funds that are available, so the funds go directly to the, uh, the, the private, the sorry, the refugee beneficiary family. Um, that would be sponsored. Um, and because the private sponsor group is the linchpin um, support um, group of support that is helping to guide the refugee beneficiary family um, through their sponsorship period, that's why it doesn't go to the uh, oversettlement agency. In this case, again, the linchpin, linchpin, I don't know if I'm using that word correctly, um, force of support for the refugee beneficiary who's helping to ensure that they uh, have all of the um, um, access to benefits and services and responsibilities that are carried out that usually where some agency does, they're the entity that is, is carrying that out. And so that's why it doesn't go to a some agency. In this case, the, the force, um, the supporting force is the private sponsor group directly themselves, similar to the Canadian system where um, it goes directly to the refugee beneficiary in the same way. On the, sh the sheltering- Thank you for that clarification, that's very helpful. Um, I I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I, I got a clarification for the question. Did you read it and you want to answer that or do you have something further to add? Sorry, I was just, yeah, I was just asking, um, maybe I just didn't see it pop up in the chat, apologies. Can I, can I add one more thing to Heidi's question in the chat about the funds? 
Um, so what we see normally in refugee resettlement, when offices receive a certain amount for each beneficiary, it doesn't go directly to that beneficiary. The, uh, the office is using it to pay for things on the beneficiary's behalf, like rent, clothing, uh, food, things like that. So it's similar with the private sponsorship expectations that groups will fundraise uh, that amount of money. Um, it's not necessarily expected that they will raise 10 grand to give directly to a beneficiary. And sometimes that's actually not recommended um, just because of, of benefits eligibility and things like that. But those funds are expected to be used for beneficiary services when they arrive. So uh, Heidi, to your point, groups are expected to help uh, beneficiaries do things like set up bank accounts after they arrive, things like that. Um, but those fundraising that fund isn't to necessarily give it to the beneficiary or to anyone else. It's it's really to use it on the beneficiary's behalf uh, for that cost of living and those uh, core services after they arrive. Um, okay, I think that's that's good. Irene, could you yeah, could you clarify the question a little bit that you asked? So the question is about um, Airbnb funding. I think you mentioned somewhere that Airbnb has uh, has a contract with um, with you all in Welcome Corps. Could you could you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, of course. Um, sorry, that was me. Is that Katie? Apologies. No, I think I think it's you. Like, you, okay. yeah, you go ahead. Okay. Um, the intention here is that recognizing that um, finding um, safe, sustainable, affordable housing um, for um, newcomers in the United States is is always um, a, a challenge, challenge for people that are already here um, to find um, safe and um, sustainable housing. And so as people, as groups are um, scoping out opportunities and preparing for the arrival of refugee family, um, if a more permanent solution isn't readily available to help make sure there is a safe um, place where the refugee family can get a start once they arrive, that there's an opportunity to um, use Airbnb credits for a temporary location um, for the refugee family as a more permanent sustainable option is found. So it's really to help ease um, uh, that responsibility on the prospective sponsor group to make it, it just um, make sure that any housing that's provided for the refugee family is safe and as it should be. And building on that, uh, we have, uh, so for our humanitarian parole offerings under our neighbor network program, CWS has an agreement with Airbnb where we have grant fundings. Um, very similarly, we are able to use that uh, up through June 30th for up to a 30 day stay. Uh, so if a group you know, wanted to sponsor, let's say a Nicaraguan beneficiary, and they could they could come really quickly after that sponsor application was approved, uh, but they weren't able to get them into a permanent housing situation until July, um, then we would have, that group would come to us and we would help them book an Airbnb stay that would come directly out of CWS funding. It wouldn't be a reimbursement model or anything um, so that a beneficiary would have a short-term housing stay until that long-term housing could be secured. Irene, Thank I think you so much. that's a, very helpful. Go ahead, Stacey. No, I think there's a question. Somebody, there was a comment put in the chat about somebody raising their hand for a question. And I, there was an offer to unmute that person to ask the question. I just want to make sure we don't miss that. Yeah, I think that's from uh, Joyce Myers Brown. Uh, Joyce, are you still on the call? And did, was your question about the same one that's in the chat about the amount of money per individual? You're welcome to unmute the um, the tech person. We'll, we'll help you do so if you're still here. I don't think you're unmuted yet if you have the ability to click the microphone yet. Yeah, I think I'm unmuted. Now you're unmuted. We can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've only heard part of the, the program, so I, I don't want to slow anybody down. But my, my question was about that original amount per person to sponsor the 222,250, whether... That's one person sponsoring one um, asylum seeker, refugee, whatever the correct term is. Or if there is a group of five, is it five times 2,000, so on, so on, to, to sponsor? That's the one side of it. And the other side is, do you, an individual or a group, sponsor more than one person, like a family of five or something? 
So that the amount that you have to raise is going to be based on the, the number of beneficiaries that you are sponsoring. Uh, so of course, like with Welcome Corps and with any of the other CWS uh, sponsorship programs like Humanitarian Parole, we have groups uh, do this in groups, not just as an individual. So when we say, you know, uh, you need to you need to raise um, you know, $6,000 for a family of, of two or a family of three, that's going to be based on the number of individuals that you're agreeing to sponsor. If you just sponsored one person through Welcome Corps, it would be that $2,275. Um, if, if you sponsored through Humanitarian Parole, we would ask you to look at the cost of living for one person for, you know, three to, to six months, depending on population or on their nationality. Um, so that's, it doesn't matter how many people you have in your group. That's it's only going to change based on the number of people that you're sponsoring. And um, I can drop um, another um, line on this in the chat. It's twenty three seventy five. Um, there's been an um, oh sorry like an, up, up, um, an, an update across um, just like the general amount of funds um, that resettlement agency used, as well as are being noted as um, the the. The minimum amount that's helpful towards a uh, refugee in this instance. So it's $23.75 um, per individual. There's more information. I just dropped an FAQ, a link to the FAQs um, that um, you, can, you can find out the information about that and the specific requirements. And there's also um, some helpful toolkits, I think, that we can share with you um, if you reach out by email. I think that help with general fundraising support and ideas around fundraising. And I will say that in our experience, um, raising money is usually one of the easiest parts of sponsorship. It's usually that sort of support of having regular volunteers who can drive people to appointments, to classes, until they learn public transit, um, having people who can do the administrative part of making sure forms are filled out and, and work with beneficiaries that way. That's usually, that's why we want the group, right? We want to be able to divide up that labor. But I think people get a little sticker shock about the number of the, the amount of money sometimes. But I've, in all the, the groups I've worked with, I've never had anyone say uh, that they had issues with fundraising. Usually once communities find out that someone's coming and being sponsored, they are, they become very, very generous. Um, and they, uh, things come out of the woodwork to support sponsor groups. Exactly. And uh, for to, to that point is I want to, um, you know, say again that we have uh, grants at UCC National available for anyone who wants to welcome through Welcome Corps or really otherwise. We have grants for asylum seekers, folks that come through formal refugee offices, um, the, Unite, the Uniting for Ukraine program. If you choose to go through Uniting for Ukraine to sponsor a Ukrainian or individual or family, we offer up to $2,000 per individual hosted. Uh, also, if you decide to go through the process for Venezuelans, uh, Cubans, Haitians, and Nicaraguans. We offer up to two thousand for each for each Haitian individual sponsored, and for all other nationalities, it's up to one thousand dollars. And the only reason for that is we don't discriminate on nationality. It's because we have appeals through the UCC for Haiti and Ukraine in particular because of um, disaster events that happen in those places. So there's a larger funding pot. Um, so it has nothing to do with the nationality, but only how much funding resources we have available for certain situations. So you can go to my landing page, I'll drop it in the chat, to look at all those resources for, for funding through UCC National to participate in Welcome Corps or otherwise sponsoring. So the next question um, that sort of comes out of that uh, from the list of questions that I have is, are private sponsor groups expected to have the same level of uh, reporting and um, you know, all, all sorts of success me measurements that a formal refugee office would have? Good question. So the short answer is no. Um, it's recognizing that the American public is not a refugee resettlement office. Um, and so there is reporting that is asked at a 30 day and a 90 day um, milestone, but it's done in a way that's conscious towards the fact that this is a group of, of community volunteers that's engaging this and um, dedicating their time, talent and treasure towards this. And so it's conscious towards that. So there is reporting that's asked, just, you know, it's, it's um, uh, as like a, uh, 
due diligence assessor for any type of program around this. However, it's done in a way that's accessible and conscious of the fact that this is not someone's full-time job. Um, so it's asking all questions. This has been coordinated with the State Department and those um, organizations, including a number of refugee resettlement agencies, um, such as CWS, who are in the consortium. It's conscious towards all the expertise that's in that, but in a way that's accessible to a community group that's acting as a private sponsorship group in this case. And that's and awesome. it's Oh, sorry. Um, just to add really quickly that there's um, a training, um, it's a streamlined training that's offered to private sponsor groups um, that talks about this and like walks through like what you have to do. And then again, there's um, a private sponsor organization as well as general resources that are available to all sponsor groups that gives them um, a heads up of what to be expected towards that. And there's coaching around what to keep in mind or to track as you're going through the sponsorship period. And again, it's all geared towards making it as easy as possible, um, recognizing that it's already um, a commitment to step in in this way. And so want to make sure that all aspects of that are as easy as possible for the group to undertake. Thank you. Uh, our next question, we probably have time for these last two questions. And then after that, you'll just have to email me and I apologize. I'm, I'm so glad that everyone's so engaged. Um, the next question is specific probably to um, the Ukrainian uh, you, you for you and also the, the process for Cubans, Haitians, Venezuelans and Nicaraguans and also uh, our, our Afghan friends that came in two years ago. And the question is, people arriving at our humanitarian parole must change their immigration status uh, within two years, it's variable uh, for different types of nationalities. Is there any plan for making legal assistance more available? Does CWS have any resources for that? That's a great question and something that is very much at the forefront of everybody's mind right now. Um, you know, of course, we're we're not usually in the in the business of having welcome uh, newcomers come and welcoming newcomers and then uh, two years later you know waving goodbye as they have to go somewhere else. So CWS is very invested in um, helping populations adjust status and and finding a uh, and. If in finding that legal support, some of our offices do offer legal assistance for those populations. Um, really depends on the resources the offices have. Uh, our remote support also includes um, helping sponsor groups connect beneficiaries with legal support um, so that they can pursue, you know, seeking asylum in the United States or, or what, whatever they'd like to do. Um, with uh, our, the APA program, our community partners um, had success in leveraging their own community connections to really connect people with pro bono or low bono, as they say, legal support uh, for those um, adjustment of status um, applications. So that that is something we think about a lot um, and is a very good question, especially when, you know, like with Welcome Corps, anyone coming through Welcome Corps, like I mentioned, will have refugee status. They will be eligible for green cards a year after arrival. Uh, humanitarian parolees, it's a little bit different. So that is something we think about a lot. Thank you. And then this last question, um, I think, is an excellent way to wrap up our time together because this is this is the grand question right here. Is uh, in from Chicago, uh, they say that we have used Refugee One, which is your brand, the a Church World Service branch in, in um, Chicago, to resettle refugees and find that services they provide are very important. We're not experts in finding housing, translation, and social service support for refugees. Will Church World Service be providing that kind of support? This is, it's going to depend on um, kind of where you are and uh, if the local office has capacity to do that. You know, like I mentioned, these private, with these private programs, there's very limited uh, federal money that is able to, to go to, to offices to support these programs. Um, so office staff often don't have capacity to work with private sponsor groups in addition to their own caseload and their, their local co-sponsors that are working with populations being welcomed through the office. Uh, so this is really meant to be kind of a standalone from the local office capacity. Uh, that said, we do have some CWS offices as we're kind of in the initial stages, stages of building out private sponsorship. We do have local offices who have expressed interest in uh, supporting headquarters as a partner in those efforts and perhaps uh, supporting local private sponsor groups, um, but we don't have good details about that yet. Um, I assume in the, in the coming weeks we'll have more information about the locations where that support would be available, but really these programs are meant to be supported remotely, um, which, you know, depending, some people are more comfortable with remote support, some groups do great with it, others really would like to work with a more local office, 
And in those scenarios, if you're close to a local office, you can always continue to pursue local co-sponsorship where an office receives clients and they say, hey, we really need groups that can help set up a set up an apartment and help do tutoring for these these clients. Um, and some groups love to pursue that opportunity and partner with that local office. They don't need to do all the services, but they are some offices have them do more than others. Um, but you know, sometimes they don't have to do all the services. They're able to collaborate with local staff. Um, and some groups really prefer that. So the, these programs that we're talking about are really for groups who are more comfortable uh, with remote support, at least for the, the time being. And I'll just add a really quick point. Um, I recognize um, that with any new program, there's always a period of time where just there's so much newness. There's, you know, there's so many things that are needed to learn about all aspects of the program. So just want to clarify that um, it will, um, support will be handled remotely. However, it may not be from, it may be from a local organiza organization. So oh, I just want to yes. say that the organization yeah. is, or sorry, the program is, um, continuing to ex, um, expand the number of private sponsor organizations that are um, a part of this. It won't just be limited to refugee resettlement agencies, although there are a number of refugee resettlement agencies, including, as you've heard, CVS is in the midst of pursuing an application. But there are a number of other um, organizations, a lot of community-based organizations that have a deep history in helping to support refugees and other um, immigrant and uh, forcibly displaced populations um, that are also eligible to apply to act as um, PSOs, or these organizations that help to guide and provide resources and information to private sponsor groups. They'll go through a certification process and an onboarding process to ensure that they are fully equipped to do so and help groups in this way. But just want to note that it may be an organization that is down the street from a private sponsor group. Um, it just depends on the locality and state. Um, so just wanted to, to lift that up. And there's, I dropped a link in the chat because there's more information about PSOs and other organizations on the Welcome Corps site. Thanks for that clarification, Lucretia. You can tell that's my CWS bias coming into play here. I'm just talking about how it's going to work for us. But yes, I, that's that's fantastic to point out. Thank you so much, everybody. And I personally just feel uh, so overwhelmed with gratitude that we have such smart professionals uh, like Katie, Lucretia, and um, and Stacy that are willing to come on this call with us and tailor their discussion to UCC concerns and also to help this program flourish so that we can welcome with dignity, which the UCC has a long history of. Not only did we, did we um, help uh, sponsor one out of every 100 Afghans that came through the 2021 um, evacuation, but the UCC has a huge long history of sponsorship all the way from the beginning of the refugee resettlement program. So we do ask that your churches take discretion in deciding how you want to sponsor and know that these resources are here. You're not alone. And uh, we appreciate all that you do to welcome with dignity. Please email me at Hassan, I H A S S A N I at UCC.org if you have follow up questions and you would like them directed either to Church World Service, Community Sponsorship Hub, or UCC National. Thank you for attending and um, I hope everyone has has a glorious afternoon.